Hey everybody! Today we're talking about power, hierarchy, and the violence that holds it together. We grow up not questioning the fact that some people have all the wealth and power and millions of us have nothing. We go to work every day to make a few people richer and more powerful. We follow the law and pay our taxes thinking we're helping out. And we discard beliefs or aspirations like freedom and justice and peace because they're just not realistic. But it's all an illusion. We don't need to be ruled by others. If we want change, we need to understand how the system works. And that's why I'm here. I'm Chris, and this is what had to be said. To start today, I'd like to say there have been some pretty interesting things happening in the world since the beginning of the year, and it's only been about a week. But you may have noticed this channel is not, at least not right now, not for a while, about current events. It's about the much larger phenomena, the forces behind the news. If you want to remember and learn from each of these videos, one thing you can do is look at current events, or history, if history is more your thing, and apply the things that I say to it. This video might be especially useful that way. The first thing you need to understand about how power works comes from Mao Zedong. He said, political power grows out of the barrel of a gun. He was saying that power doesn't come from having good ideas and getting elected, and getting everyone to like you. Power is exercised at gunpoint. Power is an unequal relationship, where one person uses the credible threat of violence to force the other, or maybe millions of others, to do what they want. Nowadays, power is usually exercised in the form of upholding the law. As such, the political system focuses on the making and implementing of laws, along with ensuring the rest of us believe the law is a self-justifying institution we should all bow down to. To understand systems of power, it's less important to understand the, the people, the individuals in the seats, than it is to understand the structure of power. The state is an institution with the purpose of concentrating and exercising power. The corporation is an institution with the purpose of concentrating wealth. And because wealth, of course, buys influence, it's fair to say that at least in this system, money is power. Because we don't understand power very well, we talk about what they do, like fencing off the commons and charging us for it destroying nature, making war on people at home and abroad, jail, torture, stealing, deceiving, as we, we talk about those things as abuses of power, as if they were aberrations. They aren't. That is power. Using violence or threats to bend people to your will for your interests. Hierarchy set up over an entire society is a class system. I'll make a video on class in the future, probably this year. For now, what you need to know about the powerful is they have class solidarity. They compete with each other, jockeying for money and influence, sure, but in the end, they know they need to work together to maintain their enormous privilege. Class solidarity is why the U.S. and Russia support dictatorships all over the world. Everywhere empires take their hierarchical social structures, they make a few people better off and a whole lot of people worse off. That's why it's misleading to think in terms of countries when we're trying to understand power and the things that sustain it, like war and prisons. We seem to assume all kinds of things about entire countries. You know, we blame, for, for instance, we blame the U.S. for all of these wars because, of course, the U.S. is 
the, the U.S. military is the main military of this capitalist empire we live under. But most Americans have no say in those decisions and don't benefit from them. And it's not just the U.S. whose military is used in these wars, it's just the biggest one. We call countries poor and rich, but there are rich people in every country. And they share a class interest in keeping the rest of us ignorant, scared, divided, and poor. They know there are only a few top spots. They know that if they don't have that money, other people will, and then their relative power drops. Historically, wherever empires and states have gone, they've left behind them some kind of social hierarchy. The nation-state system that exists today is the product of European empires. In every country, an empire created rich and poor, owners and workers, states and citizens. The evidence suggests that the first states, or what you should probably call proto-states, really, were just composed of a band of warriors and thugs who turned settled people uh, working at their farms into slaves and lived off their labor. The old kingdoms had formal militaries that were accorded money and status above all other professions. Over time, states have evolved to govern all aspects of society, so they've grown enormously and created all kinds of different agencies. So today we have still have militaries that are honored above everyone else, but in addition we also have police on local, national, and international levels, and a variety of spy agencies. Their job is to impose the will of the state, whose job it is to impose the will of the ruling class. The state's decisions are made by the most powerful people, after all, whoever they are at the time. And when you realize that, you can learn to see law and law enforcement as acting in the interest of the powerful. Wherever your interests diverge from those of the powerful, they'll be the ones hurting you. But it's not just them. There are also millions of private security guards and door attendants and people looking into security cameras. And by their authority and the higher authority they can always appeal to, the police, always just a phone call away, they multiply the power of law enforcement. Hierarchy is not just in the state. It's in the corporation, too. The reason so many of us work to make money for the most powerful people but never even meet them is because they have agents, too, who have all kinds of titles but collectively we call bosses. Now, a boss isn't the same as a cop because a boss doesn't have the legal authority to use physical violence on you. But they do have the ability to fire you on their discretion, even if just for giving vent to your conscience about the business's practices, like a whistleblower, or petitioning your boss together, like a union. Recently, Amazon has threatened to fire employees who speak out against climate change. The boss's job is to represent the people at the top. If you're not making that person up there more money than everyone else would in your position, you're gone. That's a pretty big threat. It's as strong as the threat of prison for breaking the law. It's the threat of taking away a person's income, possibly condemning them to the street in the mercy of the police. And under that threat, people work at meaningless, soul-crushing jobs for most of their lives, following every order from the boss. The, the oppressive and unequal nature of social institutions like the state and the corporation take their toll on us. Think of all the pressure most people are under to conform to the law conform to the rules of the business they work for, conform to the culture's expectations of them. 
they lead to all kinds of stress and mental health problems. We get angry and frustrated when we aren't in control of our lives, but we often misdirect it. Maybe punching down at people who aren't in a position to resist instead of punching up at the people responsible for our problems. Social hier hierarchies are instituted by violence, held together by violence, and even lead some of their victims to commit violence themselves. And of course, the powerful can use the existence of this non-state violence to scare everybody else into thinking that they're needed, that we need social hierarchy, we need police. Kind of begs the question, doesn't it? A lot of labor unions have hierarchies too. And states and rich people often pay off and co-opt the leaders of unions, who in turn might discourage striking or something like that. A lot of people look to unions as the way forward. They might be. Workers have considerable leverage over the capitalist class, and any kind of movement to take power away from, from the capitalist class would be positive. In fact, I think it'll take all forms of organization to carry out a revolution. Worker-owned cooperatives are a popular alternative to hierarchical corporations in the meantime, and they're better for you, too. People who have a say in the decisions that affect them are motivated to work for their co-op or their community, whichever's empowering them. They take responsibility. They're accountable to each other. They don't need to compete for dominance. They can all be leaders because they all know things and there's no one spot that's in control of everything at the top. These traits distinguish communities from corporations. Hierarchy, on the other hand, creates stress and fear and anxiety. As people worry about getting told off or fired or merely docked an hour's pay for coming in five minutes late. The people in charge have no responsibility to their employees beyond the necessarily unequal terms on which they were hired. Hierarchy creates positions of better pay and power over others up here that only a minority of the employees can ever attain, which others can only compete for like crabs in a bucket. People jockeying for power are forced to defer to the people at the top, to kiss their boots, to show themselves willing to serve and dominate, and to play a rigged game with a smile. And other institutions are hierarchical too, like academia, with predictable effects. Many influential members of universities get co-opted too. Academics and so-called experts lay the intellectual groundwork for justifying the current social order. Witness Neil Ferguson's defense of capitalism and imperialism in books and a number of glossy documentaries. In return, they get higher salaries than their peers, more influence in the academy or the think tank or wherever they are, and they get elevated as experts in the eyes of the public, which, if nothing else, means book sales. The corporate news decides which of them to choose as the best spokespeople for the status quo. So when people control these institutions and make these decisions, we can call them powerful. Their decisions affect us, but we're locked out of the process. Democracy, as in actual rule by the people, is impossible in such a system. It's not in the interests of the powerful for you to decide. But I care more about what's fair and right than what's in the interests of a few rich people. Why shouldn't we be in on those very important decisions? because we don't have the money and contacts that are the entry tickets to the closed rooms where these decisions are made. 
And since in a hierarchical society only a limited number of people can have those entry tickets, it's inherently undemocratic and unfair. People at the top don't only have lots of money and influence on politics. They also have the full protection of the state. Because one of the main functions of the state is to shield the powerful from responsibility. So that's what they do. That's why destroying nature or kicking people out of their homes is legal if you own property, but fighting back against it is illegal. It's why people dealing drugs in the street can go to jail for 20 years, and bankers knowingly laundering millions in drug money, and the corporation itself receives a fine. It's why during a protest, police stand in front of banks and beat up protesters. And it's why millions of soldiers and police can kill and abuse people, and only a tiny percentage of them are ever actually jailed for it. They're, they're agents of the system. They do violence on behalf of the people at the top. Most of them need to be protected from prosecution, except for the occasional time a report comes out from some plucky journalist. Then they'll throw the book at this one guy who got caught so they can tell the public justice has been done. I'm not going to talk much about propaganda until next week, because it's a big topic and it'll require a video of its own. Suffice it to say, it's in an integral part of how power is exercised today. It's the reason everything I say on this channel sounds strange or even blasphemous to most people. Maybe not to you, but your parents? I thought so. One function of propaganda is to provide us with enemies. You've heard of divide and conquer, right? You find ways to divide the people without telling them that's what you're doing. If you study the history of European imperialism, you're also studying the history of modern racism. And you can observe several times in history where races were essentially created. Like when whites were given all kinds of rights and protections over Africans in the Americas. So that while most whites actually still had it pretty bad, they would still fight to maintain the marginal privileges they had acquired. The problem continues to this day as millions of white people in the US and other countries still favor white supremacy and will hold on to their privileges like a safety blanket. That's just one example of divide and conquer. Some states will make you state your religion or race on your ID. That way you can never be anything other than that label in the eyes of the state. And if they want to use it against you, they will. One way or another, the people in power will try to provide you with an enemy. Or, if nothing else, a distraction. If we have enemies, we're distracted from realizing how our rulers are screwing us. And it can be any enemy, however abstract, like terrorism or oppression, as long as everyone agrees with the state's chosen way of attacking the enemy. It turned out the enemy was everyone who stood in the way of the state. <laughs> who would have guessed it? It may be obvious by now, but Peaceful protest alone does not constitute any kind of threat to the state or the capitalist class. In fact, it might represent the opposite, nothing more than a safety valve the oppressed can use to blow off steam, then go home and think they've done all they can. The thing people need to realize if they want a real revolution, and many of them do, of course, is any real threat to the state is taken extremely seriously and handled extremely violently. 
I think the best example in recent memory is Syria. Millions of Syrians have risen up to oppose the government and the ruling class. In return, the government and its allies killed and tortured hundreds of thousands of people and destroyed half the country. That's what it means to pose a real threat to the established order. But even in the so-called democracies, they punish dissent. Look at how Canada and the US have treated indigenous people who stand up for themselves. Look at how, how many people have been attacked and arrested for protesting the building of pipelines on or near their land. Or look at the history of the Black Panthers, uh, Martin Luther King, or, or really any black Americans who've, uh, who've spoken out forcefully about their rights. It wasn't in the interest of the ruling class to give them rights or freedoms or justice of any kind, so they infiltrated their organizations and communities with informants and arrested and killed their leadership. In fact, just two weeks ago, Robert Seth Hayes died in prison after 45 years there. Hayes was a Black Panther and a founding member of the Black Liberation Army which was formed after the FBI tried to break up the Panthers and force it to go underground. They said, Black liberation? Not in my America. There's even doubt that Hayes committed the murder he was charged with in the first place. But when someone threatens the interests of the people who own these institutions, the principle of innocent until proven guilty is seen as unnecessary. And it's a sign of how strong propaganda is that millions of Americans today would applaud the decision to cage and keep caged a true freedom fighter while also believing they're free. What we can learn from these examples is the state will do everything it can to neutralize people who want to flip the table over from a quiet almost invisible war on dissent to flattening entire cities. With all that said, everything changes, and states and ruling systems are not eternal. In fact, just a glance at history reminds us that the status quo doesn't just evolve gradually in one direction, but actually jumps backwards and forwards as people rise up and throw off their oppressors. It's actually inevitable that every nation-state you can name will end. The question is, how? Climate change and environmental destruction? Revolt, then revert? Revolution and transition to a free and fair society based on sound ecology? I know which of those I'd prefer. States and corporations and other hierarchies have weaknesses. And since there's so much to do, everyone can be part of the revolution. And they will be if they stop getting distracted and divided. It's not easy, but just remember, there's billions of us and thousands of them. <laughs>